It is. Let's not forget that in the midst of all the war that's raging about us these days to call on the name above all names. And that name is? Jesus. I didn't hear that name. What? Jesus. That's a little better. <laughs> we'll practice on your cheerleading skills later. But if anybody deserves cheering, it is certainly the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. I don't know about all these guys running up and down the field and hitting balls, passing balls, throwing balls, and all the other stuff. Everybody screams their lungs out. But when it comes to Jesus, we're... Is a guy good? Praise the Lord. I don't want to lift my hand too high. I might think I'm a little crazy. Anyway, praise the Lord. You like that sermon title today, How to Get Good and Mad? Anybody ever get mad? And some of y'all think, I, yeah, I get good and mad. No, no, that's not the way I mean it. I'm talking about how can you remain with civility and righteousness and goodness and still be angry? The Bible says, you know, be angry and sin not. So the context of this is, is that... Uh, you're going to get angry. But what are you going to do when you get angry? And I'd like to talk this because I believe that this is a very important message for all of us, you know, in, in church, in home, wherever we are in life. And, and, but yet people, multiple people working in action, functioning together, you know, anytime there's a lot of action, there's a, there's a lot of friction. If you went out and turned the car on and were able to look inside your engine, you'd see those pistons firing things moving, lots of action, which requires a lot of oil because there's lots of friction. Now, we know as believers, what, who is the oil? You know, it's Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the holy oil that we have. And so we need to be well-oiled machines if we're going to keep functioning together. Whether it's in your house or whether it's down at God's house, it's still the same. So how do you get good and mad? So let, let's look at that. We're going to look at in Psalms 19. If you have your Bible, you can open up Psalms 19, and we'll have it on the screen if you prefer. But as always, with the reading of the Word, let's stand as we honor God's Word this morning. It says, Who can discern his errors? That's a good question, amen? <coughs> Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then, when is then? Well, when you look at the words before that. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of a great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May God bless that. Say amen. amen. You may be seated. I think it's important as we look at this today, we look at those things where he talks about, you know, about discerning your errors. In other words, who, who will be honest with themselves? Who, who's willing this morning to just kind of let the Holy Spirit provide that litmus test to where we really are in our life? I mean, I think we come into church sometimes and we come with our defenses up, and uh, especially if we know there's some area we think might get spoken about, preached to, or sung about, we have a tendency to kind of put up a shield. But this morning, you know, can we just have a have this, this attitude where we're going to hear what God says and be discerning and let God speak to our heart. And this is what he's asking, you know, the Lord equip me of those, those hidden faults, those presumptuous sins. The one I want to talk about specifically today, we talked about the meditations of our heart and the words of our mouth. So often the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart are not acceptable in God's sight because, well, psychology today, uh, not that I'm a big subscriber of the magazine, but they've called this particular generation in which we live the age of rage. Obviously, you turn on the news, you watch the news, whether it's your internet or TV or listening or radio, you hear one newscast after another newscast, one media present that we are a culture that is raging. We have road rage. If you go to the airports and the tension, the pressure, there's what they call air rage. And then you look at what's happening in the culture around us, surrounding us with, with the school shootings and those kind of maddening things. I mean, this is certainly a culture that can be carry that title not so proudly, but I think it is applicable that we are a culture. This is the age of rage. It simply appears from just looking at it that we're living in a generation of people and a time of people who just don't seem to be able to control their anger, to, to handle the stress that goes along with all these things. We're just not a, able to to handle it not only in a cultural sense, but even in a personal sense. I think it's important we realize that 60% of those cat catastrophic murders that happen in our nation, 60% of those are among people who know each other. Not like we're killing mostly strangers, all right? Those people that supposedly people know and love and care about, they're the ones who are losing their life. In fact, the National Domestic Hotline released some statistics recently that said that over, you know, uh, 
35%, more than one in three women, 35.6 to be specific, and one in four men. In fact, the statistic was a little higher than one in four. It's, it, it's almost, you know, a third. It, it's like 28.5, almost 30% of men in the United States that men and women are experiencing rage in their personal relationship, whether it's been through rape, whether it's been through stalking, whether it's been through beatings, or abuse of one kind or another. Their intimate partner are the one who are causing all the problems in their life. Add to that problem another 10 million children, they state, are being abused by their parents. Who knows what that number would be if the truth ever really got out what took place in many homes. Tragically, I'm not just talking about what's out there and surrounding us, but let's think about our own relationships and our own homes that can be damaged by anger and by, by situations in our life that occur and we just respond in a really inappropriate way, in a, in a negative way. It's an age of rage. Now, how do you deal with that? I'm so glad you asked, because I want to talk about that. I don't think it's being taught in the culture anywhere. It's certainly not being taught in public schools. It's not being taught. Many churches aren't teaching people how to deal with these issues of anger and rage. The Bible does have a whole lot to say about it. Jesus spoke of it specifically on many occasions. But I want to talk to you today about how do you deal with anger? And how do you get mad and still be good? All right? How can you get good and mad at the same time? How can I respond to that passage in Ephesians where it says, be angry and sin not? Anybody get mad today about something? Anybody been angry about anything today? It happens. It's part of our life. So the subject is important for us. And I think it's really important for a lot of reasons. If you don't learn how to handle your anger, then you're certainly going to be in problems in your family. You're going to have problems in your friendships. You may lose your job. I mean, you're going to have trouble dealing with, with coworkers. You've got to learn how to deal with this issue of anger in your life, or you're going to stumble in so many different ways. You'll become bitter. I really think that bitter people and people are bottling up all the anger in their life. They're certainly unattractive people. They're not the people that you really want to be around. And so you've got to learn what to do with those, those, those feelings and, and those emotions that are genuine emotions. But before I begin that, I do want to say that being angry is not always a sin. You can be angry and sin not. It's the emotion. How do we deal with the emotion? Even God, the Bible says, is angry, all right? With, he, he has an indignation and, and an anger. As a righteous judge, he's angry every day, all right? So there is this emotion. God experiences this emotion, but we know that God always handles it properly. In Proverbs, it tells us this, those who control their anger have great understanding. In other words, if you're the kind of person who's learned how to deal with your anger, learn how to control it and have discipline in your life, then you're a person of great wisdom and you're a person of great understanding. The Proverbs also tells us in chapter 16, if you're slow to anger, that you're better than the mighty. But he who rules over spirit is greater than those who would capture a city. So you see, there is the ability, God's told us to control the anger, and God says, if you do, you're a person of understanding. If you do, you're a mighty person. If you do, you're stronger than those who would seek to control the city. But anger happens. Good anger, it's how we respond to it. It could be bad anger if we respond to it in the wrong way. Uh, and Valentine's Day, Parkland shootings. Anybody get mad about that? You know, anybody wake up and start listening to that story and all watching the events that unfolded in the news before you, the Santa Fe High School shooting, 17 dead. Anybody get angry about that? I'm certain a lot of you did. Uh, there, it boils up. You, you can feel it coming. There's a lot of anger and stuff, and, and sometimes, you know, if you, if you handle that thing the wrong way, it's going to create all kinds and multiply the problems, as you'll see in a moment with some passages that I will share with you, that anger leads to a, to a great path of destruction, or you can learn how to deal with it properly. Aristotle, not that I'm a big Aristotle fan either, he said this, anybody can become angry. That's easy. But here's what he went on to say. But to be angry with the right person and to the right degree and at the right time, and for the right purpose, and in the right way, that's not within everybody's power, and it's not so easy. But I contend that it really is, if you're a believer, within your power to do it the right way and handle it in the right, ma the right manner. Amen? So I want to look at four keys, I think, that will help you understand anger and help you Learn how to begin to take a biblical approach to when you get angry and how to resolve the issues in your life. Because, listen, there will be plenty of rehearsal for this message in your life. <laughs> Amen? Some of you said, I could have used this before I got in the car to come to church. <laughs> All right? 
Four keys, I think, that'll help you understand. Of course, you know me, under those four keys, at least one of them will have at least a little four steps. Got to have your keys and your steps, your principles and your truths, all right? But let's look at these four keys. The first one is, to, is important, you know. If you're going to learn how to get good and mad, and that's what I want to learn how to do, then the first key to learning how to get good and mad is to recognize anger as a danger sign. That emotion wells up within you. I think the first step to controlling it is to realizing what is going on in yourself. What, what is really happening there? That, that this, this anger is welling up. What's being pointed out? What I need to pay attention to? Now, I, I think you say, you know, wh why is anger a, a sign? Why is it? Well, listen to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew, he makes this statement. He says, you have heard the law of Moses say, do not m murder. And if you commit murder, you're subject to the judgment. But I say to you, if you're angry with someone, you're subject to the judgment. Now, Jesus went up and messed it all up again, didn't he? Everybody knows, Jesus, that murder's wrong, right? Thou shalt not kill. But, Lord, we all get angry. And the idea here is that you're carrying this anger through. You're not responding in the right way. You're just, you're, you're kind of simmering with this person. And he says, just as much as you'd be subject to the judgment due to murder, listen, if you let anger rule and roll, reign in your life, then you're also subject to the judgment. You say, well, then what's, what's the big deal about this? I mean, how are we going to deal with this anger? We all get angry. But we need to realize that when the anger comes, there is this signage that says, hey, there's a road ahead that if you make the wrong turn in, you're on a pathway to destruction. You're going to create a lot of problems and a lot of issues in your life. You may have heard the story about the little boy who sat down with his dad and said, Dad, where or how do wars begin? Well, he pulled up a chair, sat by his son, and said, it's like this. In World War I, getting ready to provide a history lesson, when Germany invaded Belgium, then Mom piped in quickly, abruptly. Oh, honey. Just tell him somebody murdered somebody, and that's how it all started. He rises to the occasion with a little <sighs> frustration in his voice. He says, who did he ask, and who is telling him how wars begin? To which she responds by simply turning around, leaving the room, slamming the door. Pam. Moment of silence reigns until the little boy speaks up and says, never mind, I think I know how it starts. <laughs> isn't that true though that's where it all comes boiling down and jesus said hey you should be as concerned about anger and how it's handled as you are with murder or with wars you should be concerned about your anger what's the big deal jesus now let's let's come back to jesus because he views people in a very unique way and what he's trying to deal with is how you view people you people, it's just somebody you can just call stupid and ignorant, get them away, push them over, do whatever you want. You know, don't bother me, I'm better than you. It all has to do with, it, with an attitude and, and an arrogance and pride in our life that anybody should dare question me or, or second guess me or, or consider something being out of step with me. And we just begin to respond. And Jesus is dealing with this attitude that we have about other people and towards other people. Because God holds us all in the same regard, and God holds us all with the same love. And he's saying, here's a danger side. You need to realize that you carrying on this anger with that other person is a bad deal. And you're in danger of judgment in your life over that. Why? Because there's someone I love dearly. Just as much as I love you, I love that individual. But we don't always see it that way. So we have to change the way that we think about how we're responding to other people and how we think about other people. Every time we choose anger and to choose to walk in that anger, or every time it just begins to well up within us, we need to realize at that moment, stop and slow down. We're on a, we're on a pathway to destruction in our life. We're on a pathway to, to a place that we really don't want to go. We're part way down the road to bitterness. We're part way down the road to hatred. We're part way down the road to murder. We're part way down the road to divorce. All these things can come as a part of it. Sociologists and psychologists report that, that hatred that comes out of anger, that hatred is what brings the person a little step closer to murder. You think about those student shootings and students killing other students. Where did that all begin? Somebody got hurt. Somebody got angry. The anger's not dealt with. It continues to simmer. It turns into hatred. The hatred then turns, if not checked, into murder. That's the course of action. And that's why Jesus says, be careful how you respond in these situations. 
We're on your way to violence. You're on your way to hurt. You're on the way to increased mental stress and spiritual damage. Ephesians 4.31 says, and, and listen to this passage. I don't know if I got that on the screen or not. If I did, yeah, there it is. He says, get rid of all bitterness. You got to catch this. Get rid. Y'all know what get rid means, though, right? Get out of your life the bitterness. Get out of your life the rage, the anger. Catch this. The harsh words and the slander as well as all types of malicious behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ Jesus has forgiven you. That's a pretty powerful word. Amen. Not only tells us what we shouldn't do, he tells us what we should do. In fact, it's either one way or the other I'm responding. I'm either going with harsh words, I'm going with anger, I'm going with rage, I'm going to go with slander. You know, malicious behavior is what he calls it, in a nutshell. Or I'm going to go the way of grace. Just as God has extended me grace. God, through Christ Jesus, he said, has forgiven you. Then we need to adapt that same personality, so to say. The same attitude, the same commitment, the same regard to what's going on in our life as Jesus did. You say, well, you know, well, you, you know, Brother Joe, you, you know, is anger always wrong? No, it's not. There is a righteous anger. There's a righteous way to deal with anger. Jesus obviously gave us examples of the righteous way to deal with anger. But the major difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger, well, it, put it there, it's the cause of the anger. In other words, Jesus went into the temple, remember, and he cleansed the temple, and he was angry at those who were in the temple. Why, what were they doing that was so wrong? He was angry about what they were doing, how it was harming the, the worship, how it was harming the people. If you're familiar with the story, you know that Jesus went into the temple and he started throwing over the money changers' tables first. What was happening there is that if you went to worship, it was required for you to bring a particular shekel offering in, in the temple. And it had to be a, a shekel, all right? It had to be Hebrew currency. But people, Jews came from all over the world, so they had to go get their money transferred, you know, converted. And what was happening, these guys were charging exorbitant rates to convert those Roman dollars or whatever it might have been into shekels. This was supposed to be an act of worship, a time where you're accommodating and helping people to get to a place of worship. But yet, man, it was all about greed. And it was the same with the sheep and the sacrifices, the doves and the sheep that were supposed to be offered to sacrifice. People couldn't make a long journey with that sacrifice, so they would go to the temple and they would buy something that had been cleared by the priesthood as an acceptable offering, but they were charging ridiculous amounts of money. It was hindering people. It was hindering worship. Remember all those religious people that Jesus made? He called them, you snakes, you vipers, you adulterous generation. Well, he's obviously, those are harsh words to them. It's because he was angry about, these were men and leaders who were supposed to be telling people how to walk in truth and love God, but yet it was all about them and them judging other people and telling other people how to act and how to, 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 to live their life. We should be angry in a righteous way of the things that offend God and harm others or even harm the people that are doing the wrong doing. We should be angry about those things, but we should have that directed towards sin and not to people, towards the, 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 the actions, not necessarily the actors. We believe God wants to bring grace and mercy. I know we can sit down and begin to realize there's some very large cases of brutality out there. Well, God's angry about that as well. Uh, if, let me bring it down to a little closer to home. As a parent, we need to be very cautious as parents of how we deal with our children when they're misbehaving or when they're being disobedient. That the anger that we would have in our heart is not one because we're embarrassed because they didn't do what we told them to in public, or we're ashamed, or we're disappointed, you know, or I'm tired, or I'm impatient, so I'm just bursting forth. And be living the life of Jesus in such a way that I, I'm angry, perhaps, at my child for disobeying me, but it's not because I'm embarrassed about it or because it looked, made me look bad or whatever else. I'm embarrassed and not embarrassed. I'm upset because I want my children to live righteously. I want them to be what God's called them to be. In fact, the Bible refers to that to as, as man's anger instead of a righteous anger. And James says, listen, the anger of man, God's anger is different. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Every time you get angry, 
Remember, you're part way down a road to destruction. It's a danger sign. The second thing is key to this is, you need to reflect on how much it really costs when you get angry. Anger always has a cost. It costs you, it costs those around you, and somebody is going to pay a big price for the anger. You get, you're in this situation. You begin to respond. Somebody maybe is contesting with you, and confronting you, or correcting you, or whatever it might be. How are you going to deal with that? You can go with anger, and you can choose to respond in that anger, and you can do a lot of harm. It doesn't require a gun or a sword. The Bible talks about the power of words and the power of negative words and the power of harsh words to people and how they go down and they cut and they wound and they slash. Anybody ever spoken words that hurt and cut and wounded someone else? I have. There's three of us here. <laughs> how about this next thing? You ever been caught up in a dispute and get so mad you just begin to denounce the other person very unfairly and put them down? I have ever torn up a, a person's reputation because you were offended by what they did? I have. You say, Brother Joe, you're horrible. I'm just like you. <laughs> Kathy asked me on the way but driving over, she said, you know, you, know, you, you never told people you re dealt with those things that when you got mad. And I said, well, I can't be honest and say I've dealt with every one of them. I wish that I could go back and look at those that I haven't so that I could, you know. But, you know, this is a maturing process and this is a growing process. And those that we do know of, those are the ones that we should be dealing with, obviously. You ever say this, I'll never forgive you as long as I live. I haven't. Thought it. Maybe you have. But all that comes from anger. And it's unhealthy and it's unholy. And what it does, it turns into this self-serving, toxic kind of acidity kind of thing. And Jesus is warning us against taking that particular path. Let me go to that passage back in Matthew. What's he saying? If you say you're angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call them a fool or an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the high council. If you curse someone, you're in danger of fire of hell. So you know what those words are all about? They're saying, God's saying, you're not the judge of anybody. That's what he's saying. You're not the judge of anybody. I'm the judge. And you're putting yourself in a very high place that you don't have the right to be holding Amen. if you're all the time judging everybody else. It's not your job description. Amen. It's just not. But yet we, we, we get caught up in those things. And he's saying, what's the best thing you can do is just reflect on this because it always has a cost. You, you say, uh, subject to the judgment. Hey, I don't know the full extent of what that means, but I know a lot of people who are suffering today because of the anger in their life. They've, they've lost the respect of people they love. They've lost the love of the people they love the most. They've lost the love of their own children because they always kept getting angry far too often in the wrong way. They've lost the love of a husband, spouse, a wife. You, you lose your job. So many things can happen as a judgment that we subject ourselves to when we choose to walk in anger. You ever said, that person is just a pain to me? I've said that about people. It wasn't they were necessarily the pain. I was letting them create pain in my life because I wasn't dealing with it. I mean, it causes headaches. It causes stomach issues. It causes back aches. It causes neck aches. All kinds of variety of problems that just come because we don't deal with things right. This is this passage in Proverbs 29. It said, a hot-tempered person, a hot-tempered man, a hot-tempered woman will get into all kinds of trouble. All right? And he goes on here. If, you're, if you find yourself in this particular place, you've opened the door for the enemy. That's certainly judgment. You know? If you choose to let anger control you and take a hold in your life, you've given, I like, I like this contemporary version, it says, you've given a mighty foothold to the enemy. A mighty foothold. The last thing we need in our life is for the devil to have a foot in our door, amen? Because you know what he's going to bring with him. He's going to bring every kind of evil that he can imagine in our lives. But Proverbs put this this way. A hot-tempered man gets into all kinds of trouble. Why? He's made himself subject to that. So, Brother John, I'm a hot-tempered person. 
Well, no wonder you got so many problems. That's what opens the door for it. Proverbs 15, a hot-tempered person, a hot-tempered wife, a man, a young person, stirs up strife. But catch this, but the slow to anger will pacify his contention. What did Jesus call us to be, peacemakers or strife makers? I'm pretty good at making some strife. I can introduce a whole world of strife very quickly, very simply, or I can be a peacemaker, depending on how I choose to walk with God or not walk with God in each situation that I'm going through in my life. Thomas Jefferson wrote a book called Rules for Living, which he described how adults should live. You probably heard this when you were growing up. When you're angry, count to 10 before you speak. If you're very angry, 100. <laughs> Sometimes 500. It's a dangerous place to go. Third thing of these keys is respond to anger properly. Did I, did I skip that one? One or the other? Respond to anger properly. How to get control of anger. Now, maybe that's hopefully what you've come to after just what we've heard already. You're thinking, yeah, it's an issue in my life, and I'm dealing with it. How am I going to deal with it, and what steps am I going to take? Well, I'm glad, as we say, that you asked, because let me give you about four steps that will transform your life. One is this. You may not understand it completely, but let me explain it to you. Stop hanging around angry people. Proverbs 22 says this in verses 24 and 5. Keep away from the angry, short-tempered people, or you will learn to be like them, and you will endanger your soul. If your friends and your major friends are people who are angry people, God is saying you need to part ways. He says because the tendency is always this, you become like those you hang with. Why do, why do parents always talk about to the children about you shouldn't hang with those people, you shouldn't hang with Why? Because we influence each other, whether you realize it or not. In a few weeks I'll be talking about the, the importance of picking the right kind of friends in your life because of the power of influence that people have on each other. We all influence each other. And if you're hanging around the wrong people, guess what? You're going to live wrong. If you, how many people, I want to ask you to raise your hand. We've done that. But how many have some friends that are just big complainers? That's all, they complain a lot. They just complain about this, complain about this. No matter what, if they have a complaint about it. they got something negative comes up all the time, and then they, love, they, they just love telling about it. You know what's going to happen? You too will become a complainer. And this is the idea of what he's saying. If you hang around these kind of people, then these are the kind of people that are going to affect your life. You hang around angry people, you're going to be angry. This lifestyle, he said, it is modeled, and you learn the behavior from those who are modeled, whether gripers or complainers or angry people. Those are the people you need to put back in the line of your relationships that are going on in your life. What's, why? Why is it so important? Because they endanger your soul. Well, Brother Joe, I have a ministry. Well, you can carry out the ministry. We're talking about who you spend your time of fellowship with. Who are you fellowshipping with? Second key to this is not just stop hanging around people. You need to learn how... Let me put it in the Joe Armstrong translation. Shut up and hear. Now, the more politically correct way is in the biblical way. Dear brothers and sisters, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Well, I, I'm not slow to anger. Well, the Bible tells you to be slow to anger. Well, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Uh, let's just take a moment with the uh, husbands and wives here. Y'all listening? All right. Some of you are blessed because you're, you're other person's not with you right now, so you, you, you say all you mean, all you want. But how many times have you been in one of those serious discussions? That's what you tell your children there, but you're just arguing, <laughs> right? And you're going at each other, you this and you that, well, you never this, well, you always do that, well, you always, well, you did that, well, you did that, but I wouldn't have done that, you hadn't done that, and you're going, it just starts escalating. And all of a sudden, you hear this little noise, bling, bling, bling. phone rings. Bling, bling, bling. Pick up the phone, swipe it off, and say, hey, Hey, how you doing? Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise God. God's good. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, she's right here. Praise God. Here, hold it here. Hold just a moment. You too. God bless you. <laughs> Boom, you hit it like a switch. You just shut it down. So don't say you can't. Now, I don't know why you should. It might have been embarrassed that you were having an argument. You might have been worried about your reputation. But I think greater fear is a fear of God. God sees all this that's going on in our life and in our marriage. I mean, we can't go over and pull the curtain and say, God's not going to see this part, so I'm just going to rail on you like crazy. You know, I'm going to tell you what your business is and what your business is, and I'm going to straighten you out. Listen, I know how to do that, and some of you are pretty good at it too. I'm talking about in the flesh. My flesh, hey, when Paul said I die daily, I think I have to do it secondly. <laughs> Minutely at least, Amen. 
because it can just fire up and we just let it go. And I grew up in a house with six kids. If you grew up in a lot of kids in your family, you had to learn how to survive, right? Because kids are mean. And especially, I was the youngest of the boys, all right? I was the fifth in line in the family. So you learn how real quick to defend yourself and learn how to use your words correctly and incorrectly to make your point. And this is not what I was doing in my life, being quick to listen. We're too quick to respond. We're too quick to speak. Can we just back up and be quiet for a moment and just let it go? I mean, a lot of times we get angry just simply because we start speaking. And the more we speak, the angrier we're, we're getting. I don't know who it was that said it, but it's a great statement. It says, you speak when you're angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. Can't bring those words back. Listen instead of speaking. Third point of this, don't let it burn. Ephesians 4, 26 says, you know, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, don't go to bed still angry. Best counsel I ever got and Kathy and I ever got when we first got married from somebody that wasn't a pastor, just a friend said, hey, tell you what's made our, our success in our marriage. No matter how angry you are, no matter how you feel justified, you know, you just can't let it simmer overnight. If there's a fireman here, and we have firemen in our church at both campuses, they'll tell you right away, you just don't let the embers smolder overnight. You put the fire completely out. Because all that's going to happen, you just get a little more air, a little more wind on it, it's going to blow up again, and it's going to be worse than what you imagine. God didn't make our bodies to carry around anger spiritually, mentally, emotionally, or even physically. And some of you have been angry about something for a long time, and it continues to influence so many of your relationships. You know, back to Matthew where in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, listen, if you're standing before the altar in the temple and offering your sacrifice to God, and you remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there by the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifices to God. I mean, if we took that seriously, I believe half of you would have walked out and got on the phone while I was talking. So I can't come back to church, so I'm going to deal with this. <laughs> Made a call. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said those things. Can you forgive me? Hang the phone up and come back into church. <laughs> Amen? Because that's the seriousness of what Jesus is saying. He said, there's a danger that you're subjecting yourself to, and you can't, you can't let these things boil up in your life, and you can't let these things burn in your life because they will consume you. The fourth of these steps is pretty simple as well. You learn how to cultivate honesty. Proverbs says, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. All right. You just have to learn how to, to talk to people and to be honest and to be frank and to be, you know, and to be real without letting that emotion burn up and go off on you. My, listen, there's nobody that I probably disagree more with on a daily basis than my wife. And we have a fantastic marriage. Amen. Amen. Now, seriously, we have an incredible... You just wish you had a marriage like I do. <laughs> you know? But we're imperfect people, growing. But we've learned not to let these things escalate where we're slamming doors and yelling at each other and screaming at each other. And I, I ain't divorced. You can give me a long you know, take care of everything you got. <laughs> take in the kids, too. Well, that's not a threat. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? You you got to learn how to be honest with each other. We can disagree about things. We can disagree with staff around here all the time. We talk. Well, I think I'll do. Well, I think I'll do. We don't go into fits of rage. You know, you, you go to work. You have to learn how to converse, converse with people, and talk with people, and work out plans and issues and and things that go on in life in general. You say, well, you know. I, I have a tendency to blow up. Somebody say, well, I have a tendency to clam up. And you're either one of those if you're not getting it right with the Lord, amen. Some of you are skunks and some of you are turtles. Some of you just blow everything out, it stinks, make a mess everywhere. And some of you just pull it inside your little shell. Let me put it, let's do it. You either internalize it or you externalize it. You shout or you pout. Which are you? I don't have time, we probably already know, right? Which are you? We shouldn't be either one of them. We should take these steps seriously. 
about being honest with one another and learning how to uh, shut our mouth for a moment and listen to what the real things are really being said, we may actually learn something about someone else, about the situation. That's how to control your anger. This fourth step is the most important. This fourth key is this. You have to rely on God's power. You're not going to you're not going to be able to handle your anger without God's help. Colossians says you let the peace of God, the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You know, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the peace of Christ. Let. Doesn't say make it. Doesn't say pump it up. It doesn't say, you know, struggle for it. It's an action of just allow it. You have to shut up. You have to back up. You have to let go for a moment and say, I'm going to let Christ take charge of this moment in my life. God has got you. And God is concerned about you. And God has your interest at heart. And God's going to take care of you. You don't have to always be trying to defend yourself. He is ultimately your defender. But your relationship with Jesus, listen to me, your relationship with Jesus Christ will determine just how patient you are with other people. The deeper your relationship is with Jesus, the more easily you'll find it to be patient with others. The less your relationship with Jesus is, the more impatient you're going to be with others. That's just a scriptural fact and a biblical fact. I mean, if you have a real close relationship to Jesus, you're going to discover that you have his power on your life. And you have his power in all these important areas of your life. And you can, you can learn how to trust him. And you can learn how to put it in his hands. You can learn how to say, God's in charge of this. And the more he controls your life, then just simply out of that comes a, what the Bible tells us, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's temperance. So the best way to improve your relationship with others is to improve your relationship with Christ. The more you tend to that relationship, the more you're concerned with your relationship with Jesus, the more you spend time with it. Listen, the, the easier it's going to be to relate to other people. And once you have this relationship with the Lord down and straightened out and you're where you ought to be in your walk with God, it's amazing how it begins to affect every other relationship in your life. Because out of that submission to Jesus and that love for Jesus and that walk with Jesus comes a unique patience. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and self-control and kindness. You say, well, I'm nothing like that at all. That's because you're not being filled with the Spirit. Here's the thing about it. None of us are like that. None of us. Well, he's a very loving person. Well, let's see. <laughs> She's a very loving lady. We are selfish. We are self-seeking. We're self-protective in so many years of our life. It's just a natural way that we are. In, our, in fact, the Bible tells us not only are we are not peace with each other, if we're not right with God, the Bible says we're at war with Him. It says that before I came to Christ, the Bible says I was an enemy. The Bible says that God resists the proud. That's someone who hadn't submitted their life to Jesus. He resists the proud. What's that mean? That is a military term of resistance. That there is a war that's going on between me and God. But Jesus comes and he reconciles me to the Father. And he brings me back to God. And he gives me his peace. And then he calls me to be his peacemaker. He's given me reconciliation, and along with my reconciliation came the fact that now I have a ministry, a ministry of reconciling. So if you're the kind of person who walks away with your little bag of grudge, right, and you walk and you carry it, and you, it's in your backpack, it's in your heart, it's in your mind, though you may cover it with religiosity, remember that's the stuff that Jesus was upset about using all these religious things and facades to cover up what our heart was really like. Yes. How do you deal with it? Get your heart right. Jesus died and rose so that our hearts could be right. Scripture makes it very clear, and I'll, this will be the last scripture I share with you, at least on the board today. It says in Matthew 12, for whatever's in your heart determines what you say. King James says, for out of the abundance of a man's heart, he speaks. Out of the abundance of your child's heart, they speak. Out of the abundance of your heart, ma'am. Your heart, sir. My heart. The words that come out reflect what's on the inside. And if I'm just this angry individual who hasn't learned to relate properly in the Spirit of God to God's creation and to God himself, then certainly what's going to come out of my life sooner or later 
that's going to come out and it's defiling. And it's, listen, the best way to change what you say is to have a change of heart. Have a change of heart. Doesn't mean that thoughts won't come. Doesn't mean opinion. I don't know about you. I'm a pretty opinionated person. Opinions come. Doesn't mean I have to say them all the time. Well, Brother Joe, it's just best that I just get it all out. Well, the best place to get it all out is in your prayer closet. Amen? That's where it comes out. God, I've been this way. I had this attitude. I've let this stench get on my life. I just need to, to get it right with you. Well, Brother Joe, everybody loses it now and then. Well, that's pretty much an excuse. Oh, but if you knew her or you knew him the way that I know them or, you know, she had it coming. And there's something about it when anger does get kind of self-justifying. They deserved all that. What's happening? We're putting ourselves in the seat of judgment, aren't we? That's not my business. It's God's business. Well, Brother Joe, I've been hurt. Look around this room. Everybody in this room has been hurt at some time or another. I've been hurt. You've been hurt. I've been misunderstood. I've been lonely. Those are still not excuses for us to do it. I have, I have, I have suffered loss. Listen, the grace of God. He can take your hurt. He can take those losses. He can take the abuse that you've suffered. He can take the agony, and the pain that you've walked through and restore you. But one thing that will not restore you is bitterness and unforgiveness. Never will. It may feel good in the moment when you're exercising it, but it is toxic, and it is destructive, and it will ruin your life. Your heart, my heart, that's what matters to God today. And where you are in your heart today, that's what matters to God. And thank God that he loves us, and he stands ready to forgive us. But the best thing we can do is to bring all that junk to the altar and leave it and let God be in charge. You say, well, when will he do it and how will he do it? That's not my business. I just know that God says, vengeance is mine, I'll take care of it. And when I let him take care of it, he always does. It's not my business. It's not my job description. It's above my pay grade. But what is my job description? To love God with all my heart, mind, soul, body, strength. And to love you more than just so much as I love myself. Yes. That's your job description. That's my, do my job description. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, I ask you that you would search our hearts, as David said in his prayer in Psalms 19. That you would look at us and help us discern our errors. And acquit us of our hidden faults. Lord, keep us back from presumptuous sin. Let not these things, as David prayed, rule over us. Move in our hearts today. I believe that you can bring a great revival in this moment if we'll be honest. If we won't hold these things away from you, but be honest with you. I ask you, Lord God, as we come to a place of invitation, that we'll be transparent with your Holy Spirit and welcoming to you in our lives. With our heads bowed just for a moment, today, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I would encourage you, make a surrender. Run up the white flag today. Say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. I put you in charge. You're in charge. Save me, forgive me. Deliver me. God stands ready to make you a brand new person to wash away every sin. Can you imagine? Every sin gone. Everything made white as snow right before God. I encourage you today to give your heart and life to Christ. So how do I do that? It's the opening of your heart. Believe in your heart. Trust God today. 
and commit to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's called repentance. You're turning from yourself. It's called faith. You're turning to Jesus. Any one of the men in the altar this day, four of us standing here, any one of us would be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior. You have a decision to make. If you're a Christian and God's spoken to your heart about this issue, then I'd encourage you to do something about it. Today, it's time. Find a place in this altar between you and your Heavenly Father. Put that on the altar. Say, I brought it before. Bring it again. Praise God for grace. Amen. Praise God for grace. But as we worship the Lord, it's your opportunity to bring true gift of worship, a heart to be made clean. Let's respond to the Father as he calls us today. Would you step out now? Would you obey the Lord? You come as we sing, as we worship. You.